everyone. Thank you very much for your attendance. Um, Mathieu Coutenier and I are very pleased to welcome you to this workshop on political economy, cultural economics, and uh, gender. So we are very pleased to, to have you today. And so this workshop is motivated notably by the fact that researchers are increasingly providing evidence that cultural context matters in determining the efficiency of development policies. And so along this line, some researchers have highlighted the need for policymakers to move beyond the one size fits all strategy, and especially in the context of developing countries uh, where there is a wide cultural diversity. And even further, this need to take local cultural context into account to design more efficient uh, policies is particularly salient when it comes to improving economy, uh, women's economic rights and, and opportunities in such developing countries. And so the aim of this uh, workshop of today is to gather prominent US-based and Europe-based uh, scholars working on these very important topics. And as such, we are very pleased to have four speakers today. Uh, we will have in uh, this order, Eliana La Ferrara, Eduardo Montero, Nathan Nunn, and Sonia Balotra. All of them have substantially contributed to, to the fields of political economy, cultural economics, uh, and gender. And further, all of them have notably worked um, uh, on developing countries uh, context. And so we are very excited to discover uh, their last work in progress today. Before jumping to more uh, logistical and organizational information, I would like to warmly thank the ENS de Lyon and the CPR for their help, and in particular, Nadine Clark uh, for the organization of the, of the workshop. So this workshop will be held uh, on Zoom. Uh, you might know that you can mute or un unmute your, your microphone. Let me say that each uh, presentation will last for 45 minutes, and then there will be about 15 minutes of discussion for questions and answers. So if you have some clarification question, please ask them in the chat. And as a moderator, Mathieu or I could interrupt the speaker if this is a clarification question. Otherwise, if you have more general questions or suggestions, Please wait for the end of the, of the talk, ask your question in the chat, and as a moderator, we will allow you to unmute your microphone to ask your question. Let me also say that our first speaker, Eliana, will have uh, her co-author, uh, so they might also be able to answer to your questions directly in the chat. Uh, let me say that some of the sessions will be recorded, including video uh, and audio, so if you interact with the speaker, this means that you will be recorded with the exception of Nathan's presentation. Um, so we are very delighted to have Eliana La Ferrara as our first speaker. Eliana is the Invernizzi Chair in Development Economics at Bocconi University in Milano, uh, where she also directs the LIP, the Laboratory for Effective Anti-Poverty Policies. So Eliana's research focuses on development economics and political economy, and she notably particularly, particularly explored the role of social factors in economic development. She notably uh, studied ethnic diversity, kinship structures and social norms of the effect of television on social outcomes, and in particular outcomes related, related to uh, women's empowerment. Uh, and today she will present a paper, which is a joint work with Selim Guleski, Sam Jindani, and David Smerdon, Munshi Sulaiman, and Pete Peyton Young which is entitled A Stepping Stone Approach to Understanding Harmful Norms. So dear Eliana, thank you again very much for accepting our invitation. We are very honored to have you as our first speakers. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's really a great workshop. So I'm, I'm truly honored to uh, be able to present this work. And uh, as you said, Selim and Sam are in the audience and happy to answer questions in the chat as we go along. So um, this is a paper about harmful norms. And uh, uh, we know that many of these norms uh, persist despite the fact that they are highly costly from an individual point of view. Let's think about dowry payment, child marriage, female genital cutting. And uh, often uh, they persist uh, despite the fact that countries pass laws against these norms. Okay? And the conventional approach that governments or non-governmental organizations have adopted is to sanction uh, such uh, actions uh, uh, by pushing for outright abandonment. Okay? The dowries are outlawed. Uh, 
child marriage before you know uh, 18 years is uh, um, illegal in many countries, and so is FGC. Yet uh, people keep doing uh, uh, this. So what the paper tries to ask is the following question: Suppose that your goal is really to get rid of these norms in the long run. Then what are the consequences of having, instead of a, a zero one uh, approach, uh, allowing for an intermediate alternative, which we might consider mildly harmful, okay? So for example, in the case of dowries, instead of saying uh, they are outlawed, you would say there's a cap. Uh, in the case of child marriage, you might say, okay, instead of waiting until 18, wait until 16 or something like that. Now, the answer to this question is not trivial. Of course, there are, there's a lot of um, you know, um, moral ground that we're not going to cover in the paper, but abstracting from that, even from an economic point of view, the answer isn't trivial because on the positive side, what you could think is that if the law was ineffective because people are reluctant to abandon something completely, um, then maybe these same people might be persuaded to go from a very costly trade, cap T, to the less harmful alternative. And then once they take this first step, eventually it might be easier to take further steps and eliminate the harmful trade altogether, okay? So this is what we will call the stepping stone convergence process. On the negative side, however, precisely because this intermediate trade is less costly, it's possible that incentives to abandon it uh, eventually are so low that it becomes an absorbing state, okay? So in this case, instead of transitioning to the absence of the costly trade, you remain there forever. So eventually we need to understand uh, what governs one or the other type of transition. And to do so, we propose a model uh, which is a model with social interdependence, as many of these uh, um, norms type uh, of models are. And uh, the model will uh, study the transition dynamics and also characterize under what parameter configurations this intermediate trait plays the positive role of being a stepping stone and when instead it becomes an absorbing state. Okay? And I'm going to show you in the second part of the talk an application to one of the possible um, um, norms that I mentioned in the beginning, which is female genital cutting. And for this application, we collected survey data in Somalia. Uh, you will understand why that's an interesting context uh, in a minute. And uh, what we're going to do is really descriptive in the sense that we are going to check whether um, the data uh, suggest that our model's assumptions are reasonable. And also we're gonna check if the data is consistent with the type of transition dynamics uh, that we would expect. Of course, for something like this, uh, it's extremely hard to generate exogenous variation, say by you know, randomly introducing an intermediate uh, trait uh, when you're talking uh, about a harmful norm. So the goal of this empirical section is mostly to, to say, what can we learn uh, on the realistic versus unrealistic nature of different parameter configura configurations in the setting that we have. So the paper contributes to two strands of literature. There's this literature on social interaction and coordination as well as on evolutionary game theory, which so far has mostly focused on this uh, binary choice. And uh, what the paper does is, uh, uh, you know, extend to the case of n actions greater than two, and also study intermediate run dynamics as opposed to uh, just long run dynamics. And on the empirical front, of course, the list could be even much longer. Um, you know, a broad literature on gender norms, and also a, a literature on FGC. And here again, the literature has neglected this. Uh, intermediate traits, uh, uh, as well as the problem of transition. And uh, uh, although, as I said, ours will be a descriptive contribution, still we think that some of the uh, data that we collected is quite original compared to what's existing out there. Okay, so I'll start by just giving a very brief 
uh, background uh, on SVT in Somalia because this is going to help me use uh, practical examples and language when I present the model. And then uh, I focus mostly on the model presentation. In this case. So SGC uh, is the practice of cutting or removing uh, part of the femur genitalia for non-medical reasons. Uh, it's extremely harmful in terms of health, both at the time of cutting because of infections or bleeding and in the long run, for example, for complications during childbirth, uh, higher prevalence of STIs and so on. It's estimated that over 200 million women are cut worldwide, and uh, uh, the, pre the practice is uh, prevalent in over 30 countries, mostly in Africa, but also uh, some in the Middle East. And East. Here you see a map of Africa and the uh, uh, prevalence rates uh, estimated by UNICEF, uh, which range really from uh, very low in the light yellow uh, countries to extremely high. So we have countries like Somalia, Egypt, uh, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, um, and uh, uh, Guinea, where uh, over 90% of the women are cut. Okay? So this is actually much more widespread than one would think um, nowadays. Now, the reason I, I think we think this is an interesting uh, application of the model we have in mind is that although the, this course is mostly about the uh, female genital mutilation or female genital cutting as it was one thing, uh, the WHO distinguishes between different types, okay? And we go from a milder type, which is just the removal of the clitoris, to excision or infibulation, which is really uh, the most uh, uh, barbaric, I would say, uh, uh, practice in terms of uh, narrowing the vaginal orifice and uh, just healing and restitching everything. Now, uh, in Somalia, we have two types, two categories, which uh, are con uh, called Sunna and Pharaonic. And Sunna uh, merges uh, types one and two, uh, while Pharaonic is type three, okay? So uh, we will think when I present the model of the extreme um, uh, harmful action as uh, cutting through pharaonic circumcision, and of the mildly harmful alternative as the soon. And uh, just to give you a flavor of what's coming, um, here is data that we collected um, from uh, uh, rural communities in Somalia, where we interviewed women and we asked uh, when they had been cut, if, you know, almost the, the vast majority of them had, when they had been cut and with what type. And we see that up until the early 90s uh, to mid 90s, virtually uh, all the women who were cut were cut with pharaonic circumcision. So this uh, red uh, line up here shows you that, you know, uh, over 90% of the women had pharaonic and very few had sumo, okay? But then a sharp transition occurs and nowadays, basically, pretty much everyone who's cut is cut with Sunna, and Pharaonic is uh, uh, about to disappear. So we see that uh, Sunna, while initially non-existent, has managed to replace Pharaonic as the no dominant norm, and we're going to try and understand uh, this type of transition in the eyes of our, uh, in the, with the lens of our model. Okay, so I will present the simple version of the model where there are three actions. In the paper, we have a version with N actions as well. And uh, um, so we uh, work with a large but finite population uh, um, and, uh, of N people. And the actions are going to be indexed as L, M, and H for low, medium, and high intrinsic utility, in the sense that if we think of intrinsic utility as uh, related to the health cost, as we will do empirically, uh, the low uh, action is pharaonic circumcision, the medium one is sooner, and H will be uncut. And PI denotes the proportion of people in the population who are playing a given action uh, at a given point in time. So the state uh, is uh, of the uh, game is described by the uh, three elements PLP and PH and utility of 
uh, individual for, from choosing a given action I when the state is C is given by two components. The first one, which we denote as UI, is the intrinsic utility. So these accrue to the person regardless of what others are doing. Okay, so the fact that Pharaonic, for example, has very high head costs doesn't depend on how many are doing that. The second element of the utility is a social component where uh, the more people are choosing actions J that are different from yours, the lower is your utility. So this SJI factor is the social pressure uh, that agents who are playing an action J exert on those playing the different action I, okay? So this will be clearly very important for us uh, to generate uh, the dynamics. We are making some assumptions, uh, which is first of all, that the actions can be ranked, okay? So they are ranked in terms of intrinsic utility, uh, low, uh, less than medium, less than high and also that there is positive social pressure whenever someone chooses an action different from you, okay? We're also assuming symmetry to simplify uh, our proof. And one uh, important assumption is that we're assuming that the further away someone's action is from your own, the more you sanction it, okay? So for someone who is uh, um, uh, playing, who's choosing pharaonic circumcision, uh, their negative sanctions are going to be greater on people who choose uncut than on people who choose tuna. Why? Because somehow tuna still represents a form of compliance with the tradition that's not too different uh, compared to uncut. And so we're assuming that this type of monotonicity um, uh, holds. Okay? Uh, we work with continuous time and agents receive revision opportunities at random intervals. And uh, uh, we're going to call a norm the state in which all players choose a given action. And we'll say that the norm is stable if it is a Nash utility. For example, playing uncut is always strictly stable. Okay, So if you end up in the uh, high uh, utility uh, norm, that's going to be uh, one equilibrium. And we can prove that regardless of the initial state you start from, the process will converge to a strictly stable norm in finite time. Now, uh, the switching can be described basically by adding or subtracting this uh, uh, vector, uh, which is one over uh, the population size, so that uh, the idea, the representation of an agent that starts from a state P and switches from action I to action J, okay, can be simply um, um, represented as going from P to P plus EIJ. And this is a notation that we're going to use in our proof. And so we're going to say that this action will be J stable if you couldn't improve your overall utility by going from I to J. Okay, so this is what this inequality is uh, telling. And uh, uh, we call it stable in general, if and only if it is J stable for all J different from us. So here's the first thing I'd like you to remember, which is our definition of stepping stone. Okay, so a stepping stone is, um, a, we denote the intermediate action M as a stepping stone if the low action is H stable, but it is not strictly M stable, and M is not strictly stable in and of itself. So what does this mean? So the first part which says that the low action is H stable means that if we are in a binary choice model, starting from low, which is for example, starting from pharaonic, you cannot go directly to H, okay? It's H stable in the sense that you would be stuck there with pharaonic. Now, the fact that L, L, however, is not strictly M stable means that if you instead pick pharaonic against Sunna, that transition can occur, okay? So you can have a first move from low to medium. And then the fact that M itself is not strictly stable means that once you're there, 
you're not going to stay there, but you will move to H, which would be uncut in our example. Okay? So that's the definition of setting stone. And so if N is a setting stone, the unique strictly stable state will be the high uh, action equilibrium. And then in this case, our theorem tells us that the process will converge to the desirable uh, norm of H. Now, what are the conditions for this to happen? So there's a series of uh, three inequalities that are necessary and, con and sufficient conditions. And uh, these inequalities represent the following. The first one tells you that this SLH, which is the social cost of switching from the low to the high action, is relatively high compared to the gain in intrinsic utility that you would have, okay, uh, with the high versus the low action. So this fact that this social cost is relatively high means that basically the direct transition is not going to happen. The second condition tells us that instead the social cost of going from L to M is low relative to how much you gain in intrinsic utility, and that's why the first step of the transition can occur. And this second, uh, third, sorry, inequality ensures that the third step uh, will, uh, can occur, sorry, second step can occur, okay? So eventually these are quite intuitive given what we said earlier. And uh, uh, a necessary condition for this intermediate action to be a setting stone is this reverse triangle inequality, which says that the social function from L to H uh, must be greater or equal than uh, the sum of the two intermediate functions. So basically, this is going to tell you that if you are in a setting where uh, it's too hard to move from the highly harmful to the perfectly unharmful alternative, sometimes splitting this cost by two might um, uh, possibly allow for such a transition, okay? Or splitting this cost in such a way that the sum of the two is even less than the one you were starting from. And uh, this is kind of a rationale for a um, smooth or gradual dynamic uh, in uh, abandoning norms. Now, um, our second proposition tells us that when this intermediate action is a strict setting stone, what we uh, expect to happen is the following. First, uh, agents, because you are starting at the bad equilibrium, CL, agents will first deviate to M. Okay? So there will be a first mass of people who go from the harmful to the intermediate action. And then when a fraction Q star of people are playing M, and Q star is given by the quantity here, uh, at that point, the people who were in the bad uh, action L are going to switch directly to H, okay? And uh, the M players are also at that point moving. So this is a threshold property where what it takes is for a first critical mass of the community to do the transition from the bad equilibrium to the intermediate action, and then everyone is going to move eventually to the uh, beneficial uh, uh, case of H. So here you see an example of the dynamic, okay? So we're starting from uh, uh, anywhere uh, near the um, bad uh, equilibrium where people are playing L, and you see SMH in this example is relatively low. So this means that once you move towards the intermediate action, then the system is going to take you all the way up here to H. Okay, so the uh, long-term uh, equilibrium here is this uh, H, um, the norm where people play uncut or H. Now in this second example, uh, the parameters have remained the same but we have increased the value of SMH, okay? So this tells us that the transition from the intermediate action to say uncut is now gonna be sanctioned more harshly. And you see what's happening. You start from uh, the bad equilibrium and then you're gonna end up stuck here in M. So M is becoming an absorbing state. H is still an equilibrium. If you were to start around here, you would go there. But if you start from L, you're going to move to M and not to H, okay? 
And uh, in the paper, we also have a formula for the waiting time that it will take us to reach this uh, high um, uh, norm. And we show that uh, actually the fact that you are introducing these intermediate uh, uh, steps is going to uh, always slow down the process in those scenarios where L was going to go to H uh, directly. Okay, so if you are not in a uh, situation where you can't move from L, if L was transitioning to H, then the intermediate action is going to slow down uh, the speed, speed at which you uh, reach. So if we were to try and answer the question, so is it a good or a bad idea to have this intermediate action from a welfare point of view? First of all, we can say, if you start from L being H stable, so this means that there's no way to get out of L in the binary model, then introducing M can only improve welfare because if it's a stepping stone, then great, we're going to go to H. If it's an absorbing state, then again, you're stuck at a, a norm which is less harmful than L. Okay, so if you're sure that L is stable, this uh, intermediate action is the way to go. But if you're not sure that is stable or actually if L is not H stable, then what's happening is that in the absence of the intermediate action, the process would go to H. And then we are in three possible scenarios. First is that M does nothing and the H remains the best response even when you start from PL, okay? So in this case, the intermediate action is neutral from a welfare point of view. The second possibility is that M now becomes a best response and an absorbing state. So here we are strictly worse because instead of transitioning to H, you're stuck at M. And the third is one where M becomes the best response, but it is a stepping stone. So it is not stable. Eventually you are going to converge to H, but at a slower pace, okay? And as I said, we formally derive the waiting time. So even in this third scenario, we would say that welfare is reduced because it's taking you longer to go to the uh, good equilibrium compared to the binary. Okay. And then in the model, we uh, extend uh, um, the simple framework that I presented, uh, first of all, to allow for heterogeneity. And we model it either as difference in preferences or uh, front of deviations and under both modeling uh, uh, assumptions, what this does is that basically it enlarges the set of parameters for which M can play the role of stepping stone. So intuitively what's happening is that if there is a um, heterogeneity at any point in time, there's always going to be someone playing something else than the prevailing norm. And so this makes the transition uh, easier. Uh, the second extension, as I said, is this N action model uh, instead of the three action I presented. And here uh, we are showing that there is a function which is the a ratio of the social uh, function to the utility, intrinsic utility parameter. And depending on the concavity or convexity of this function, the stepping stone uh, exists or not. Now, let me uh, try and move to the empirical part and uh, uh, discuss how we try to, um, you know, look for um, correlates for these uh, parameters uh, that I showed you in the model. So we were in the field uh, in 2020 in uh, 141 communities in Somalia, uh, where we interviewed over 2,000 men and women. Uh, these were people who were taking part in community meetings for a different data collection. However, notice that they were not recruited uh, for anything related, you know, where we would explicitly say that it was going to be about FGC. So um, whatever selection in the sample is uh, uh, people going to a gathering in the village, not something that's uh, um, specific to the topics of FGC. And uh, uh, we collected data uh, through questionnaires uh, administered by enumerators on FGC type, attitudes, and beliefs. So here you see a snapshot of the three types 
of uh, uh, action uh, by community. So every thin line in this graph is a different community. So it's 141 of them. Uh, and we have ordered them in increasing uh, order of pharaonic circumcision. So basically, everybody in the community can be either uncut, that would be the uh, green uh, color here, or have tuna, that's the red color, or have pharaoh. Okay? And so what this graph shows you is that there's an extreme amount of variation with some communities being by far uh, uh, prevalent uh, uh, in which uh, pharaonic is by far prevalent, and somewhere instead uh, tuna is by far prevalent, and quite a big range uh, of communities where they are almost, um, you know, equally prevalent. Now, uh, sadly enough, the share uncut, as you see, is uh, never, uh, pretty much never above 20 percent, and there are many communities where everybody now, uh, you might think, okay, community level um, surely is informative, but uh, how about uh, traditions that might have to do with the clan or the sub-clan uh, to which people belong? So here you see the same um, split by sub-clan. So there are uh, three, two main clans uh, in Somalia, Darud and Bir, and the sub-clans are associated and listed down here. And basically, what this picture tells us is that pharaonic versus tuna is not something that's dependent on culture as being, uh, okay, this clan has pharaonic and that clan has tuna, okay? Within each sub-clan, we observe both types. Now, um, what I told you we would do with the data is, first of all, uh, think about uh, descriptives on uh, uh, model assumptions. Uh, here, just to give you background again, uh, you should think of a context where girls are cut around the age of nine, and uh, in the vast majority of cases, it is the mother uh, who is responsible for the decision, um, often also jointly with the father. But uh, it's something that's sort of uh, perpetuated by women on women. Okay? And uh, um, the first model assumption that we had was this ranking of utilities where we said that uh, uh, pharaonic has lower intrinsic utility than tuna, which in turn has lower intrinsic utility than anka. Okay. Now, uh, measuring intrinsic utility is, as you may imagine, uh, very problematic because, uh, um, you know, uh, we couldn't really think of uh, uh, questions where you would go and ask, um, you know, how much utility does this give you? So eventually we thought there's some objective uh, parameter that people are very well aware of, which is uh, what type of complication have they experienced, if any, okay? So we asked that question. Uh, did you experience any complication? Yes or no? And uh, you see in the first column that 63% of the women experienced complication from Saronic and only 11% from Suna. Okay, this is the mother herself. In the second line, you see the daughters. So we polled mothers about complications experienced by their daughters. So if you think of a steady improvement of uh, um, health uh, practices, you might expect this to go down a lot. And uh, for Pharaonic, you see that's not the case, okay? It's still uh, almost 60% of the cases that report complication. It does go down for Suna. So nowadays, only 3% uh, of the girls who have Suna experience health complications. And as we will say, this is a factor that should be taken into account when we think about whether, uh, you know, the stepping stone transition will occur or not. Now, if you ask about what type of complication did you experience, uh, infection, bleeding, difficulty in delivery, and all of this, you see these are an order of magnitude higher for pharaonic compared to Okay, so women are well aware that pharaonic is extremely costly from a health point of view and Suna not at all. Second assumption was that uh, um, there is this higher sanction uh, for people who go further away from the norm that you approve. Okay, so here again, we thought 
quite hard about how we could uh, have these bilateral comparisons because it's not it wasn't just a matter of saying oh would you punish someone who does uh, uh, pharaonic it was really about uh, pharaonic versus sunnah or pharaonic versus Anta. so we designed this question uh, to capture second order belief uh, which was like a vignette we said suppose a mother and father choose pharaonic circumcision for their daughter but their son wants to marry a girl with sunnah how would this and then unhappy would be the case in which they sanction and happy or indifferent would be the case in which they don't sanction. okay so by estimating the share of people who say unhappy for a given pair in a community we have an estimate of this slm and uh, here you see that uh, uh, the share of people who say that going from uh, uh, pharaonic to uncut would make parents unhappy is 59 percent which is greater than going from pharaonic to sunnah at 41 and also greater than going from uh, sunnah to uncut okay so this comparison of the direct cost of the big jump versus the two smaller ones seem to hold finally i told you we were trying to look at these dynamics through the lenses of the model this is the same uh, graph that i showed you in the beginning and uh, I mentioned that uh, um, basically this uh, transition uh, was kind of, uh, you know, coming from a situation where everybody was doing one thing and then it, it switched. Now, if, we, if you look at the timing, what this coincides with is the period in which human rights campaigns had, men, had made a strong push against Pharaonic and also religious leader in Somalia had started emphasizing that pharaonic had nothing to do with Islam, okay? So they kind of distanced themselves. So in terms of our model, this can be represented in three ways that are not mutually exclusive, but have the same implications for the equilibrium. The first is a decrease in SLM. So because the religious leaders are now, uh, you know, kind of making it uh, uh, more, uh, um, consistent with Islam to have Sunnah, then going from uh, Pharaonic to Sunnah is not seen as uh, a violation of uh, uh, the social um, potential sanction uh, from a religious perspective. The other is an increase in UM because the endorsement of Sunnah increases its intrinsic utility from the point of view of your religious belief. And also a decrease in UL precisely because these campaigns were conveying new information on the health cost of pharaoh okay so all of these in the these changes in parameters in the model would potentially lead to the transition and uh, now we're gonna just uh, try to close saying now that we've seen this transition to sunnah here okay uh, on top the blue line is there is it going to stay there or are we gonna move to uncut okay so first I'm gonna show you the same graph where for the girls who have were born in years very close to our survey and so who were too young to be cut we asked the question of whether the family was planning to cut and this is the black line that you see here or whether they they were planning not to cut this girl ever and this is the green line that you see here okay so you see that uh, from the uncut girls about 20 percent of the families are saying that they will stay uncut forever and 80 percent say that it's just a matter of time but they're going to be cut okay so compared to a situation where almost nobody was uncut this 20 percent is an improvement but if we were to think about how likely is it that Sunna is might be an absorbing state? Certainly, this 80% in the aggregate is kind of worrying. And now I think I um, yeah, there's maybe this that I could uh, uh, skip. It's uh, um, it's something about the uh, uh, social cost. I want to go to the threshold because I think I'm almost uh, out of time one clear prediction of the model was that uh, in terms of the dynamics we would see people switching in big numbers after this uh, uh, proportion q star 
had already switched to two. Okay, so what have we done here? What we've done is we've uh, uh, taken the predictions of the model with heterogeneity, okay, and uh, we have looked at community level values for those uh, uh, parameters of social class. So for each community, we estimated the share of people who said that the, the, the uh, parents would be unhappy going from uh, uh, Suna to Ankat. And basically, we are predicting that if this sanction is very strong, then the transition. Yes, I have one minute and I will go. Okay. And uh, if instead the sanctions are relatively mild, the transition might uh, occur. So I'm going to show you two par non parametric graphs where we uh, show the proportion of people who are Suna cut in the older cohort and the likelihood of being uncut uh, in the uh, for the individual. Okay. So basically, this share of Suna cut in older cohorts is uh, um, one way of saying, uh, um, you know, uh, temporally, where are we starting from in the beginning? And uh, this, what is it that uh, happens to girls who are cut? Are they going to uh, be cut or not? So on the left hand side, we, uh, um, we show the fraction who's not planned to be cut. Okay? And this first graph is for those communities where the social sanction is estimated to be in the top 50% of the distribution. So high sanctions. You see that regardless of how many people have, or have SUNA instead of Pharaonic among the old cohorts, uh, nothing is happening. Okay, so this is where the model doesn't predict a stepping stone. Here is communities where the social sanctions are mild. Okay, so we're going to from SUNA to Ankat is actually uh, not heavily sanctioned. And here you see that when enough women in the older cohort already have SUNA, so this is like saying that a few years ago uh, there was uh, a mass that got SUNA, that's where today's intentions for the future are moving uh, very uh, sharply towards uh, Anka. Okay, so if we were to say where does Q star lie in this graph, it's around 80%. You need 80% of the community to have had SUNA before uh, you move to the um, uh, uh, best equilibrium. So overall, the evidence says that uh, only in some communities this intermediate action might uh, play the role of a stepping stone, uh, and in others, no. In others, it's an absorbing stone. Okay. So uh, we've shown you this model. Uh, it basically provides a framework, we think, for policymakers to assess whether uh, abandonment versus adoption of intermediate norms might make sense. Uh, and then, uh, in our case, we think that the data um, suggests that the framework is reasonable, although uh, it, it clearly shows that uh, in some communities uh, it could be a stepping stone, but in others not which leaves room for policy intervention that are quite different in the two cases. And we think that other applications could be quite interesting to study. For example, I mentioned uh, child marriage and uh, different countries have uh, passed laws restricting the age of marriage over time. Uh, one very different context might be uh, things like smoking. Uh, if you think of electronic cigarettes, are they going to lead to abandon them? abandonment or are people going to get stuck there and uh yeah I, I we although the application is to fgc we think that uh, this principle of stepping stone um, hopefully has very wide applicability and should be of general interest outside of this particular area thank you thank you so much eliana very interesting fascinating uh so we have some times for questions so if you have some please uh, raise your hand in the chat or ask them, and then I will uh, allow you to unmute your microphone. So, waiting for some questions. I have one, um, Eliana, and but I, I suspect you've you already thought about that. 
Um, would you have some um, FGC ban as policy experiments in Somalia or in neighboring countries? And if you have some in neighboring countries, would you have some ethnicities with overla overlapping uh, um, uh, territories in order to see whether you may have some spillovers for, for some ethnicity? Yes, yeah, so um, there are and that I think uh, Selim and I have uh, supervised at least a couple of uh, uh, master theses at the Codeon League in the past years. Uh, different countries have passed uh, laws against the GC, Burkina, Egypt. Uh, uh, there's uh, more than uh, one example uh, in Africa. And then uh, um, you could try and think of this in this uh, uh, analysis. Uh, now, the challenge is that uh, different from Somalia where basically all clans um, uh, adopt the practice uh, and adopt different forms of the practice. In places like Kenya, for example, it's very uh, polarized. So some ethnic, ethnic groups, uh, typically the ones uh, uh, which are close to Somalia, uh, cut and many others don't cut at all. So in, in terms of defending this strategy, it's not obvious that you can find a good uh, counterfactual. Uh, and so what you're suggesting uh, of looking at uh, uh, groups that are across the border uh, might be the solution. Uh, and here I, th I remember in West Africa, I think there is, uh, uh, I forget if it's Guinea, uh, where you can find uh, a couple of ethnic groups that are cross border uh, and, uh, and look at that. Uh, I don't remember the finding. We had another student who did it, uh, Jamie. Selim, do you remember what he found? No. But at, anyway, I think that is a potential uh, way to study it. Now, uh, obviously, one should worry uh, about the fact that the passage of a law um, is often preceded by changes in public opinion or you know, something that uh, might reflect uh, uh, endogenous changes in preferences. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, um, I think in this case, it would be a matter of understanding the plausibility of this uh, identifying assumption. Also, one thing that matters is whether you enforce it or not, because in many cases, these laws are passed and then people uh, for many years see that uh, it's not at all enforced and then uh, there's very little happening. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I think uh, in overall studies, study pooling all countries and all years uh, in which the laws have been passed, we haven't seen. We have followed a couple of these uh, uh, attempts uh, uh, on single countries uh, uh, within Africa to look at it. So you said these bans were not allowed by uh, significant effects on FGC. This is your point. Uh, I don't know that I can uh, use that causal language, but I, I can tell you of instances uh, in Burkina I know quite well because we tried to work uh, there and then we gave up simply because people uh, refused uh, to talk about FGC. Why? Because after many years of uh, inaction the government had started uh, uh, putting people in jail. Okay so at some point they enforced it and it became very difficult to um, you know collect data uh, in Somalia, it's basically so, you know, ubiquitous that there is no uh, concern whatsoever about uh, uh, discussing it. But uh, um, yeah, on the enforcement side, that's again even harder uh, possibly to identify uh, from what I know of the existing data, but it is uh, um, one relevant issue. Thanks. Are there some questions in the chat? I think my co-authors must have done a great yeah, job. <laughs> you got a lot of them during the talk and they did the job well. Yeah, I, I might have a very last one. Uh, I was just curious about the issue of self-reporting regarding your own FGC as a, as a woman versus FGC of your children. Okay, so there's a, uh, that's a great question. So first of all, I um, my understanding is that uh, um, there is really not a form of recall bias in this case because uh, you very well know what you have and you very well know what your daughter has. So in terms of uh, memory, there's no issue. 
The question is whether there is a bias that's chosen by the respondent uh, for types of social uh, pressure of different forms, uh, possibly uh, in front of the enumerator. So here, uh, again, uh, as I said, you know, the uh, field observation suggests that this is not something that people find uh, uh, dangerous to talk about uh, differently from Burkina. But we try to get at this by um, including in our questionnaire uh, these measures uh, that uh, uh, Divadar, Tanzan, and uh, Sima Jayatanzan had used in a recent paper, uh, which itself is borrowed, I think, from social psychology, where you ask the people a battery of questions. Uh, and depending on the answer they give you, you understand whether they try to please you or not. Okay? And so we split people uh, into people with high social desirability bias, which means those who try to please you, and people with low social desirability bias, uh, who are not trying to please you or not as much. And in the first two columns, you see what they say about the type of cut of their daughter. Okay? So as I said, in the new young generations, very few are pharaonic cuts, and it's similar across both groups. The share suna cut is uh, virtually identical, and also uncut or uncut and not planned to be. Okay? So um, you can see that uh, to the best of what we can um, you know, measure, uh, this uh, um, proxy for whether you want to please who's in front of you asking the question does not correlate with the type of cut that you report. It's for, for your own cut as a woman, right? Do you observe the same regarding uh, your plan regarding your daughter's future cut? So there's a correlation if you run that regression. Uh, that uh, first of all, there's if you look just at cut um, um, as a dummy, regardless of the type. In the old generation, the variation is very little. Almost everybody is cut. If you look at the type of cut you have and the type of cut of the daughter, uh, that's predictive. And, uh, but that also possibly reflects the local norm, okay? So if you were pharaonic cut because uh, everybody in the community cut pharaonic, unless there is a transition, you predict that also the daughter is cut pharaonic. So it might be the mother's own idiosyncratic preference, but our model would predict the same thing in terms of equilibria because the type of norm prevalence, unless there is a transition, is going to be the same for mother and daughter. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you.